stung Michi, finding hope in an earthly hell. The smoke rises, rising, and lazily drifts to the east. I look out the smudged window of the moving van and see the looming horizon, and wonder what is happening. Suddenly the methane gas invades my lungs, clinging to the back of my throat, making it difficult to breathe or even swallow. I choke. As the van makes its way up the hills of the rough garbage dump located at the outskirts of Phnom Penh, the stench intensifies even further, a horrid reek that seems to have a life of its own and makes my eyes water. We turned the corner and there it was. I was told that our group, a contingent of students from Rochester Community and Technical College, RCTC, to study intercultural communication and perform various service learning projects would be traveling to a place called Stong Michi, located on the outskirts of Phnom Penh, the capital of Cambodia. I had heard that Stong Michi was one of the poorest areas in Cambodia. And although throughout my experience in Cambodia, I had seen many scenes of, po of poverty, people forced to live lifestyles that filled my heart with sorrow because I could not believe that human beings should ever live in such a degrading situation. But none of my previous experience could have prepared me for my encounter with the conditions and the people of Stung Michi. I learned that Cambodia remains one of the poorest countries in the world for many reasons. During the Pol Pot regime from 1975 to 1979, nearly 1 1.7 people were systematically murdered or allowed to starve to death by Pol Pot's followers, the Khmer Rouge. The first to be killed were the educated classes doctors, lawyers, and other professionals. Families were separated, taken from their small farms and forced into communes located throughout Cambodia. The city of Phnom Penh was immediately evacuated of almost all its inhabitants. The economic situation in Cambodia was completely obliterated. Once the Khmer Rouge had overthrown the Viet were overthrown by the Vietnamese in 1979, the Vietnamese ruled for 10 years. Many Cambodian people were eventually able to return to their farms and homes. However, some had nothing to come back to when they returned from the forced labor camps. Finally, when some order was restored by the UN in the early 90s and sovereignty returned to the Cambodian people, the country was still ravaged by war. <sighs> Over the years, some families lost their lost their their farms and moved to the city to find employment. Unfortunately, because of illness and governmental corruption, many of them ended up in Stung Michi. Right now, about 70 families currently live at the dump. My extraordinary experience came on my third day of my second trip to Cambodia. A long day of digging wells and planting trees was about to come to a close. We were about to head back to our, our hotel when, we were, when I was informed that there would be one more site that we would visit. We stopped to buy food and canned milk, and with these supplies, I realized that we would be going to a very poor region if we needed to bring food. With our vans loaded, we made our way through Phnom Penh, swimming through the flowing river of motos and wagons, until the paved roads crumbled away to dirt, and the, bro and the buildings deteriorated to small shanties. As if it were a riptide, the garbage and filth on the sidewalks and roads hastily increased. We turned a few more corners and there it was, the garbage dump of Phnom Penh. The smoke was my first of my many notices. It was black as oil and profusely burning and rising, blackening the sky that was once a majestic blue. Our van drove through the plains of sorrow and filth. I looked up and beheld the monstrous Mount Everest of garbage on which crags and peaks beheld people. People. The ground was smoking, and I knew at once that the fire was underground. A Dante's hell, perpetually burning under the soles of their feet and under their lives. The van door slid open, and I trudged through the small, through the crowded van, and stepped down. I was standing on garbage, and I was walking on a landfill. The sudden swarms of people came. We had brought food and some of it the members wanted to hand them out. So we made a line so we wouldn't get hoarded by the mob. 
As I passed out bread and ramen noodles, I thought in the back of my head, why are these people here in such a dangerous environment? Then I overheard a conversation and learned that they were mostly outcasts trying to feed their stomachs by harvesting the recyclable garbage. Many of these beautiful faces I learned were HIV AIDS victims and they lost their future when they had contract contracted the diabolical virus. I walked away from the vans to think. Then looking up from my troubling stare at the ground, I saw more workers bent down digging and digging and digging in the internal filth. The filth that had clutched their bodies, lives, and minds and souls. This black waste and oil that ran along my feet was ever flowing through their veins and is a part of them. I walked on to follow a group that was going to secretly drop off boxes of milk at homes that were to the east of the base of the dump. I walked on and encountered children playing, their skin charred, black, from the toxic waste that they were rolling in. Yet, these children with not but skin on their clothes and clothes to their skin were smiling. They were smiling. I walked past them as my white skin and long hair becoming an attraction from their games and the children running around me. I stride with confidence towards the small village of shacks, but homes to these people. I walked down a slope and grazed across a plain, which separated the garbage mountains and the homes to the east. There was a lot of bags, of st bags and styrofoam boxes, and they all were compacted into what, from my point of view, looked like a plain. I stepped down into the garbage, off the little knoll, and everything shook. What the? And then I fell. Whoosh! My left foot sank into what I couldn't explain. Then the black, oily, the black toxic waste squirted and sloshed around my ankles and shins. I put my right, down, my right foot down for support to pull out. Whoosh! My right foot splashed right into the mess. My heart was racing as I began sinking and sinking up to my knees. Cold, black waste was overrunning me, dragging me under and gl grasping my flesh. Then slender, but amazingly strong arms grabbed me, and I was hoisted above to safety. I looked above, and there was a small, middle-aged woman, very slim look woman, looking sympathetically down at me. Sweat and dirt covered her face, yet I could see a great sense of beauty and grace hidden beneath the filth and by all her apprehensive and distant approach on life that had been caused by limitations for a better future. This woman, whom I have nothing in any way to relate to, was pulling my arm and dragging me to an unknown place. We moved swiftly past the plain and crossed the toxic march on large floating bags. Thankful that I had made it to the other side, all I could say and think was, oh well, too bad. I was embarrassed, as these people obviously knew, not to step on that plane. This thought of modesty quickly changed when I caught a glimpse of her worried face and realized that I had stepped in some very nasty refuge, refuse. She was pulling me past some homes and then arrived at her own. A small open room shed more than anything. But this was all she and her family owned and thus love ra radiated around it. She placed me at the side of a house near a water basin, and I knew at once what she was going to do. She was to wash my feet and legs. She got to her knees, along with what looked like the, the elder in the village matriarch, and began to scrub and wash my legs. I couldn't believe what was happening. This family was cleansing me. I knew that there were no wells and that they had to buy their, city from the wa their water from the city. Some of the poorest people in the world were wasting their valuable water to wash my Gap cargo pants, clothing that was probably sewn down the road at the garment factory. Soon the children joined in, and before you knew it, the entire family was scrubbing and washing me. I was overwhelmed by their kindness and simple human compassion. They didn't expect nor think of any merit or profit. They clearly wanted to help me. I found it ironic that she had nothing and yet was more than willing to give me everything. She and her family were diplomats. 
on a mission to help me. They didn't ask for me to give them money or to lobby them. All they wanted was to help me to help make this world better by helping and connecting our peoples through compassion and love. This diplomacy is diplomacy for peace and diplomacy for love. The diplomacy that our world is in need of great abundance. Diplomacy to change the world. Thank you. My name is Jordan Wente. I am 13 years old, and I currently attend Triton Middle School.